It's episode 15 of Podcast Local from On The Go FM. I'm Jason Norris. Previously on Podcast Local, I started a mini-series on ethical choices in podcasting. I shared an ethical dilemma I faced when editing a documentary about an old, scary, abandoned building, and I was told that one choice might make for a more compelling story. But that choice would have required a manipulation of the truth. If you haven't heard that story and the decision I made, check out episode 14 of Podcast Local. Local podcasting is about telling the stories of our community, and how we tell those stories is important. Unless you make fictional audio dramas, telling true stories in truthful ways is probably your goal. But there is a tool we all use that has the potential to deceive our listeners. And that tool is our audio editor. Audacity, Audition, Reaper, Pro Tools, or whatever digital audio workstation you use. Our audio editors are powerful tools for making us, our guests, and our stories sound amazing and engaging. But if that power is not handled responsibly, we can end up telling true stories in untruthful ways. And unless you believe the ends justify the means, it's hard to call them true stories anymore. So let's look at ethical editing on this episode of Podcast Local from On The Go FM. You'll hear editing insight and advice from Steve Stewart, who does this work for a living, as well as my wife, who used to work in a radio newsroom editing stories. And hear again from Butler Kane, who started this whole journey by talking about codes of ethics. Support for Podcast Local comes from the Satchel Podcast Player. Satchel has a feature that supports you and your local show. Find out more at satchelplayer.com. What is truth? That's an important question. If you want to tell a true story about people, places, or interesting things in your community, how many facts do you need to make sure you've told a true story? If you only tell some of the facts, it's possible to affect listeners' perceptions of that person, place, or thing. What you leave out may be necessary to understand the whole story. This is where ethical editing begins. It starts even before you open your audio editor. It starts with your research and your understanding of the story you're about to tell. Journalists face this every day. Can you imagine a job that requires you to have a deep understanding of an event or an issue, perhaps in an area that you've never studied? And then that journalist writes or speaks what she knows, only to get a fact or two wrong. You know how harsh the criticisms can be. People expect to hear the truth, the whole truth. But it reminds me of what Butler Kane said in episode 12 of Podcast Local. Journalism is never 100% truth, and, and you can't really determine how the audience is going to take the information that you give them and what they're going to do with it or how they're going to think about it. It's never 100% truthful objective. Journalism at its best tries to get to reality as it is. It'll never be 100%. It's just impossible. There's a a book that I teach out of that I think that demonstrates this really, really well. It's called The uh, World News Prism. And the idea is this, is is that we see things like light goes through a prism. So let's say if you take the white light of objective reality, and maybe we're able to know this or maybe we're not, but if you take this white light and it goes through this prism of understanding, all of the different rainbow colors, those shades of colors that come through that prism can give us a good representation of how we understand that information. And so I think that's actually a good image for understanding how media shares information. It's going through these particular prisms of our culture and our own personal understanding and our own biases. And as professionals, we try to mitigate those as much as we can, but it's never 100% effective. Rarely, if ever, can a story be told with 100% accuracy. If we weren't there, we rely on the memories and records of others, which may contain mistakes. And even if we were there, 
We only remember what we experienced personally, not what others experienced from their perspectives. And even then, sometimes our own memories aren't accurate. But does that mean we give up striving for accuracy? Does that mean we stop practicing our storytelling skills and our ability to explain issues in a way that our listeners grow in their understanding? No, of course not. But I say all of this to point out how difficult it can be to tell true stories in truthful ways. It takes a lot of effort, and even then, we can fall short. But it's worth it to our listeners if we try. After all, they expect us to tell the truth. In the previous episode of Podcast Local, I asked if it was right to fake the elements of a story in order to tell the truth about something. And by elements, I mean the audio you hear, or what's on the screen if you do video podcasts. And that's when I asked you to listen to 99% Invisible. Their episode 256, called Sounds Natural, is all about the design of nature documentaries. No spoilers yet, but I will talk about that a little later in this show. If you have not listened to it yet, go get it. The link is in the show notes for this podcast. That's 99% Invisible, episode 256, Sounds Natural. And don't worry, I will give you plenty of warning before I get to the spoilers part of this episode. So ethical editing begins in the research and writing stage of your podcast with the goal of understanding and then explaining as accurately and truthfully as possible. Now let's look at audio editing. And to offer some insight into the audio editing process and potential pitfalls is Steve Stewart. I'm Steve Stewart from stevestewart.me. I've been involved in podcasting since 2010, and now I edit podcasts for a living. As someone who has spent countless hours editing other people's words, I thought he could provide a good answer to this. I mean, have you ever considered the impact of even little edits and the impact that can make on the meaning of someone's message? You can change things simply by leaving a pause or taking out a pause I remember Dave Jackson presenting at a, a conference one time. He used this really great example of how the gap between a question from a wife and the answer from the husband can change the meaning or at least the perception of the answer's meaning. And here's what the, the wife's question and then the husband's answer was. Are you cheating on me? No. Now let me do it again and give a little pause between the question and the answer and see if it sounds any different. Are you cheating on me? No. It doesn't take Olaf from Frozen to point out the fact that he hesitated, and that does change the perception of the answer. What does it mean if somebody asks a question and then they wait? So why cut out anything? I mean, especially considering the changes, even unintentional changes, you could make to a person's meaning. I think, and this is a personal opinion of mine, I think it's important to make the change because not everybody is a you know seasoned professional speaker not everybody's michael hyatt in fact most podcasters are not professional speakers and their guests are not always professional speakers not everybody has been publicly speaking in front of crowds for a number of years not everybody has gone through toastmasters not everybody has had that opportunity to hone their craft i'm still making mistakes and you know i, I was podcasting for how many years six or seven, and that's still not enough to not make errors and mistakes. So when you get somebody who's not seasoned, who's not a professional speaker, there's going to be times when things are said and they weren't meant that way. And this is, again, where it's dangerous to be an editor because you can change the meaning. But when somebody comes in to a conversation and they're using words like sort of, kind of, maybe, I don't care who you are, and I don't care what the topic is. If I'm listening to an interview with someone who's perceived to be a subject matter expert and they're using the words kind of, sort of, maybe, that makes them sound like they're unsure of what they're talking about. And I didn't sign on. I'm not listening to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. That's not what I wanted. 
as an editor, I take those things out and it totally changes the feel of the conversation. I think it's very important. Instead of just talking about it, let me play for you a piece from an interview that it just drove me crazy when I heard this, because here is an author being interviewed about a book he wrote about budgeting and paying off debt. And the question was, well, how much debt did you have? And here was his answer. We were probably in about right around $50,000, probably. Probably in about right around. That piece of audio right there made me think that the interview was not authentic. It was authentic because I actually know the person being interviewed. But what a difference it makes when you're talking to a subject matter expert and they do not use words like kind of, sort of, maybe. In my opinion, if we don't edit those out, then the listener is cheated. They don't believe what they're hearing. And unless the guest is lying through their teeth, I believe they also want to come across as knowing what they're talking about. Okay, so what precautions should you take so you don't change the meaning of their message as it pertains to pacing and false starts, pauses, and and their individual speech patterns? Well, I'm always going back and listening again to my edit. It only takes a second. You cut whatever it is, you run your cursor back a little bit, start a few words before, maybe a full sentence before, and hit play again so that you make sure that the edit is clean and then that it's a coherent sentence and that the guest or the host says what they mean to say and it's not a bunch of mumbling and it's not a bunch of wishy-washy kind of sort of maybe stuff. All right. Thanks, Steve. Jason, thanks. Steve Stewart started a Facebook group for podcast editors. It's cool to be in a group where people love editing and like talking about it. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you'd like to join too. When it comes to editing, one concern is usually mentioned. Authenticity. Those who never edit sometimes say they want to be their true selves. This is how I talk. It's not perfect, but it's the real me. Many of those who do edit have come to the realization that our true selves can sometimes be hard to listen to without a few edits. I've tried a few unscripted, unedited episodes, and the impression I got was they didn't go over very well. When I talk without talking points or a script, I tend to wander around a topic before getting to my point. In other words, if I'm telling you about topic A, I'll realize after a couple of sentences that my point about topic A won't make any sense at all unless you first understand this about topic B. But to understand topic B, I need to share a little bit about topic C. And when I finally say all of that and I return to topic A, you're completely lost and it's my fault. And even when I do finally get to my point, I'm usually very abstract. That is the real authentic me. My mind lives in the world of ideas. I utter phrases and questions like, I wonder, and what if, all the time. That is who I am. But if I express myself without editing, very few people would appreciate my wanderings and my wonderings. Steve Stewart mentioned a good reason to edit people was the fact that Many guests on podcasts are not professional speakers. They're not comfortable talking into a microphone. Many podcast hosts are in the same situation, no matter how long they've worked at it. I used to work in public radio, and most of the people you hear on the radio are professionals who have practiced their craft. Public radio hosts are known for their conversational style of speaking. Once I discovered that style of radio, I adapted to it quickly. I prefer it. However, there are a couple of problems with that. For one, the conversational style is usually a highly edited one. In fact, a show called On the Media once offered a peek behind the curtain showing how the public radio sausage is made. Well, there are more than a few ethical questions raised. 
If you're an editor, I highly recommend you listen to that segment, and I will link to it in the show notes. The second problem is the word conversational. Actual conversations are filled with ums, you knows, pauses, false starts, and restarts. It is human to say, uh, well, you know, things like this. Sometimes we use our so-called filler words to signal to others that we're not done talking yet. Without a verbal pause, others will jump at the chance to get their word in edgewise. So I believe there's a dilemma here. If I speak with my true voice, my unedited, authentic self, you may have trouble following me. You may think I don't know what I'm talking about. I might not sound confident to you because I say the word, uh. But if I edit out that, uh, along with other words, then you'll be able to follow my train of thought and you may think I do know what I'm talking about and I will sound confident because I speak clearly without hesitation. But that me is not the real me. It's the edited me speaking in a pseudo conversational style. As much as I love the art of editing, I can't help but wonder, is it right? By the way, another reason the news is edited is because there's not a lot of time to tell today's top headlines. My wife, Tiffany Norris, used to work in the newsroom. She worked at Alabama Public Radio more than a decade ago, and she worked in commercial news, too. The other day, I was talking with her about this episode, and she offered a story that I thought was fitting. So I opened up the Boss Jock app on my iPhone, and I recorded the story right there in the minivan. So back when I was a radio reporter in Birmingham, right after college, we had the practice. It wasn't really a company policy, but time was always valuable in our stories. They had to be, you know, 20, 25 seconds. So we took out all of the ums and ahs and things like that in our quotes from people that we had interviewed. And there was a particular county commissioner who... I don't know if it was exactly a speech impediment, but the way he spoke, he paused a lot and there was a lot of ah, ah, you know, kind of sounds in there. And as a practice, I cleaned that up um, a lot to just save time and to make the story more concise. But also I realized one day after I had done that a few times that I was making him sound significantly more polished than he came across in person. And I thought about that for a little bit and how easy it would be if I agreed with his policies or didn't agree with his policies, or if there were another person, you know, opposed to him that just by using that technique that I could make one of them sound significantly more polished and one of them less so, and could potentially influence how listeners viewed these people because of the way I edited their remarks and cleaned up what they said or didn't clean up what they said. Maybe there's uh, an election going on, there's a candidate that's saying something, and then someone just fails to fully clean up that and fully edit that. Yeah, if you're hearing these other people, you know, you've got three candidates for a position, and the first two sound fine, no um, speech issues, no ums, no you knows, all of that. They just come across as smooth and professional. And then you've got the third guy, and you let him talk naturally, as people do, but you don't clean that up at all. It, definitely there's going to be a difference. That could really be an ethical issue. Wow. Just think about the power of editing. Think about the power you have every time you tell a story. And for anyone who edits for a living, what happens when you are completely opposed to the views expressed by your client? Do you edit them in the exact same way you do other clients? Or if you interview someone that you don't like that much, 
How much do you clean up their filler words and uh, other sounds? Now, just to be clear, I'm not accusing anyone of crossing that ethical line. I'm being my true, authentic self and wondering out loud, asking questions, trying to get you to think about these issues. All right, so coming up, a look at the nature of documentaries. Are they journalistic? Should they adhere to codes of ethics? I'm going to talk about what 99% Invisible discovered when they explored nature documentaries. Spoiler alert! If you haven't listened yet, find the link to the episode in the show notes and listen to the show. When you're done, come back here for my perspective. And after that, please, I want to hear from you. Support for Podcast Local comes from the Satchel Podcast Player. It's a podcast app, and you may be thinking, I already have a podcast app. That's how I'm listening to you right now. Yes, I get that. And this podcast app does much of what your podcast app does already. However, the Satchel Player does a couple of things that are of help to you as a podcaster and as a listener. The first thing is the local feature. There's a big button. It says local, and you click that. And it'll show you podcasts that are produced near you. Some are shows locally focused, like Beyond Bourbon Street in New Orleans, I Am Salt Lake in Salt Lake City, or This Is Rammy in Ramsbottom in the UK, and the yet-to-be-named local podcast for Richardson, Texas. Other shows are locally produced. In other words, they could be talking about any topic. But the podcaster lives in your city. That local button reveals all of that. However, if you are a podcaster, you need to go register your show at satchelplayer.com. The second thing the Satchel Player offers is a quick, easy way to give money to that podcast you enjoy hearing. Within the app, you can simply click and send a donation through PayPal or Patreon. Again, if you're a podcaster and you want your listeners to have an easy way to support your show, Go register your show at satchelplayer.com. It works on the iPhone and the Android. Find out more at satchelplayer.com. Okay, last warning. Spoilers ahead. If you have not heard that 99% Invisible episode called Sounds Natural, stop this now and go listen. Here we go. There were three things about that episode that bothered me. And the first, let's go ahead and just get that out of the way. Foley. Foley. Are you serious? Faking the sounds of real life. Foley is fine in Star Wars. I mean, who knows what an actual lightsaber battle would sound like. But now we all do. We all know that because of the amazing work of sound designers. But Foley, in a documentary about the real world, only leads to misunderstanding the real world. Did you catch that part about the sound an elephant makes when it walks? Thanks to fake sounds, we all have a false understanding of that reality. The second problem is this. Do the ends justify the means? So our telephoto lens can see the animals, but we can't hear them. So let's call a Foley artist to make up some pretend noises to make our documentary sound interesting. I know not everyone has a problem with this, but I do. If you can't capture the sounds, say that. If you added sound effects to enhance the experience, say that. If you couldn't film wolves in the wild, say that. Just say what you did to bring the documentary to life. Just tell the truth. And that leads to the third problem I had about this. What bothers me is the expectation of listeners or viewers. If people choose to watch a documentary about wolves or lemmings or Orson Welles, they're expecting to learn something true. They are curious and expect you to tell the truth. 
If you tell your true story in untrue ways, I believe you're crossing a line. The better way, the ethical way, is to tell the story as well as can be told within the limits placed on you. Don't use fiction to tell a true story unless you tell listeners that's what you're doing. Trust them to be mature enough to understand why you're telling the story like that. So that's what I think about that. Do you agree or disagree? I would like to hear it. And for other questions I raised in this episode and questions that were raised in your own mind, please respond with your perspective. The easiest way is to comment on the website or click contact at podcastlocal.com. That's podcastlocal.com. I'm Jason Norris. Thank you for listening and for sharing this episode of Podcast Local from On The Go FM. And I look forward to hearing from you.